Welcome to Off Watch. It wasn't really our plan to release an episode at this point. We're actually in the middle of the Ocean Race Europe. But as part of our update show, The Daily Fix, we were talking to Juan Kuyamjang, the designer of Corum, about all things Imoka, what makes the foils work, and why we see some of the differences that we do in the fleet. It was such a good interview, and the information was so interesting. If indeed you are interested in that kind of thing, that we thought it was just a bit too good to put in our hard drives and tuck away. So we're gonna release this as a bit of a special episode. We really haven't done any editing to it at all. So for those of you that are scientifically minded, you will find this very interesting indeed. For the rest, I suggest that maybe you get a piece of paper and a pen and try and follow along as closely as you can. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy this incredible opportunity to hear from somebody right at the heart of a very interesting fleet. If you do, you can subscribe uh, for all our latest interviews and our updates. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we will start with Juan. And I began by asking him why it was that we were all so obsessed with the foils. Well, I suppose it's because it's the biggest novelty that, uh, I mean, the, the previous generation of Imoc has had foils, but they, they didn't have the uh, movement freedom that the la last version of the rule allowed. So I think that the enhancement of performance due to this uh, opening in the rule last time, and therefore the uh, design of specific foils uh, really jumped the performance of the boat so much that uh, became sort of a central part of the, of the boats because they actually started flying in some conditions. Uh, so I suppose that that's why the attention is driven to that, but, but they remain, of course, key and important, but, but it's, not, it's not the uh, only uh, relevant aspect of performance, as you know, you know, the, the hulls, uh, because a lot of the times the boat uh, sail in a, in a mode which is uh, called skimming, which is sort of at the, you know, you have, you have on one extreme the Archimedean sailing, which is uh, basically the sailing at the mass of the boat. Then you have the flying and the other extreme, which is when you have through the appendages or any device, you end up over, overcoming the actual mass of the boat and then you actually fly. And then when you fly, such as the America's Cup, you, it becomes a... Uh, a different game altogether, and then you you, you end up uh, having issues or relevance of something uh, such as the flight height, let's say. You know. uh, and then in between, you have um, all sorts of semi-Archimedean to skimming uh, uh, conditions, and the skimming is the sort of the last the last bit of the Archimedean phase, which is just before the boat sort of takes off. Now. In that phase, it is extremely um, difficult to uh, calculate and it's extremely difficult to actually model that uh, phase because you still depend quite a bit of, um, of the contact of the hull to the water, uh, but without the, the mass of the boat, you're almost, you're almost lifting the mass of the boat. So um, the resistance becomes very hull dependent on a very chaotic flow, because the flow, which is at the, at the edge of the free surface of the water and in contact with the hull, is almost like spray. And uh, it drags quite a bit, but it's very difficult to simulate because the CFDs are cool on, you know, like normal fluid. In fact, CFD likes honey kind of fluids, but then the, the more you take it to vapor, <laughs> it, it stops liking it. So to simulate those transitions are extremely hard. Uh, and uh, that's where the Imocas, they spend most of their time. Um, if you go into like the America's Cup, uh, where you always flying, that's, I mean, I hate to say that's kind of easy, but it's easier at the America's Cup, but, but it's a lot easier to simulate that than, than the transitions of the Imocas. So I think I'm fair in saying that the Imocas today are the most complex sailing yachts to design ever, <laughs> even beyond the America's Cup. So. It is quite a challenge. And that's why also uh, you see, we, we talked about last time, you remember you, you asked me some questions last year and we touched about, upon this. And, uh, and uh, that's why I, I remember telling you there'll be some boats that will do very good in some conditions and not so good in others. And that's kind of what's happening. You know, the different solutions 
um, make uh, boats be very good or not so good in different conditions. And the delta between those is huge. Sometimes you can have like four, five, six knots of difference. And uh, and so uh, and in the in the Van Dijk, during the Van Dijk Globe, some of these came out. But but you know, being single-handed around the world doesn't give you. I mean, the the constraints that the it's not so much about boat performance, it's a lot more about other aspects. Whether when we go into the ocean race, when you, the boats are uh, being able to be pushed a bit more because of the crew, then uh, for us designers, it's great because then we start seeing things and relevant uh, with the simulations that we've done. And um, and so it, it's very exciting. I was, I was following this race. Uh, I've been waiting for this for a long time. So it's, it was finally getting some pretty good data. It's, it's, it's good. Well, let's talk about some of the observations that you made, because um, I, I can imagine, like you say, obviously, if you're working in America's Cup, you're the top of your game in design, but you are just working in that one state most of the time. You're flying. In the Ocean Race Europe, we're seeing everything, certainly with the Amokas. So what have you? what can you help us to understand about the different approaches? We've got linked out with foils that are different, shapes on different uh, sides we've got 11th hour racing with one curve um Bureau valley with another curve what are people playing with what what can you see well um yeah first of all on linked out uh, that configuration being asymmetrical it wouldn't be allowed in the rule they had a, a dispensation to do that which, which is great i mean I, i'm, I'm not, no problem with dispensation i think it's a great idea uh but but that would not be allowed in the uh, IMOCA rules, so it, it's not something that IMOCAs can have, unless they have a specific dispensation, which I don't think will be the norm. Um, is but, this for uh, testing? Is this for sort of, are we going to test one foil on one side? And well, the problem is that they, they're building, uh, I understand, I mean, it's for them to say, uh, but I understand that they're building uh, the new foils, and so they only had one available, so they use one of the old ones and one of the new ones. Um, and so they got a dispensation for, for that. But, but, but it's, it, it's great. I mean, even, I'm sure they learn more than anybody, but even us looking from the outside, we kind of learn. Um, but the, um, so how to answer your question. The, the key aspects of the foils are that um, you basically have two modes when you're using them and when you're not using them. Uh, when you use them, uh, they need to basically provide a certain amount of vertical force and a certain amount of side force, which is what counteracts the forces of the sails. So um, to do that, they sort of need to, once they extend it, and, and so and they pro in doing that, they provide writing moment. So they need to, in order to in improve or increase the writing moment they provide, they need to be further away from the boat. So you end up extending them. And so in order to do this good uh, combination of vertical force, side force, and writing moment, they need to be into, they end up being in a position uh, of a certain angle, let's say, which is in the roughly about 20 degrees, 20, between 17 and 25 degrees um, from the, uh, so further away from the boat. Now, what happens if you, if you go flatter or more horizontal than that, say 20 degrees, you end up doing more vertical than, than, than uh, side force. And then you end up in some conditions having a lot of leeway and being very unstable vertically, because this is all about having some kind of stability as well. Uh, if you do it the other way, you end up having too much side force and not enough um, vertical, and therefore you need a lot of speed to get the boat out of the water. So there is, everybody's kind of once the foils are extended, everybody's within a few degrees of each other on, on, on what that angle is. And then because the foils are carbon fiber, they deform or, or composite, they deform quite a bit. So you need to account for the deformation um, uh, because the what matters is how they sail, not how they are built. So when you're, when you're now, designing them, you draw the curve on the paper, you put it into the computer, you build it to that curve, but in your head and in your calculations, you've worked out that actually it's this shape on paper, but when it's loaded up, it's gonna be this shape. And that sounds like yeah. a real headache. Yeah. yeah, it is, it is quite complex. And uh, Guillaume's done that really well. I don't know if you notice, he's got this kind of funny inflection on the, on the um, foil. And so he's done that to impact the way that the, uh, tip of the foil deforms and he's clever. Um, 
it comes with a bit of a risk on the structures, but I think obviously he knows what he's doing. So he's been very clever in, in dealing with that. Um, the, but the other thing is the distance from the hull, which now has been um, restricted under the new rule. But for, for the previous floors, which are the ones we're seeing now in the race, um, you, would, you would argue that the further away you put that foil from the boat, the uh, more writing moment you get. Now, you end up encountering two big uh, walls when you play that game. One is that uh, the further you are, the more structure you need in the strut or in the sort of inboard part of the, of, because, you know, the, the bending moment increases. Therefore, the thickness and the structure of the foil needs to be thicker. And that drags a lot when it's in, in the water. So you have a writing moment to drag uh, situation then. And then the other one is that if you create too much writing moment and Bureau Valet is kind of up there, uh, you end up getting very close, if not already redlining into the limits of the rig, uh, which nobody knows really <laughs> where they are. But we know there's a limit, um, but we, we're flirting with it. And, and so, um, you know, you end up having these, um, to answer your question, sorry, I went through a full loop, but um, basically the difference of the foils we're seeing is the, the angle you kind of want to get and uh, a little bit more horizontal or a little bit more vertical depends where you sort of want the boat to be optimum for more downwind performance or more upwind. And that's a key point that I can touch upon if you want. And then uh, also uh, where you want the foil or how far away you want the foil from the uh, hull as a function of thickness and writing moment and, and drag once it's extended. But then there are some phases which you don't want the foil, you're too slow. Like, like for example, in light airs, like you've seen in the, in the images of the, of the, the last bit of the, of, the, of the previous leg. And uh, in there, you just don't, you want the foil to sort of disappear. Uh, and, uh, and so in order to do that, uh, you need to create some curvature or some um, shapes on the, uh, on the part of the foil that actually goes inside the boat so as to make them disappear as much as you can um, uh, when you don't need it or when you don't want it. Uh, it's very difficult to make the lured foil completely disappear unless you retract it completely, such as what we do in our Kappa Preg or Ugo Boss. But if you, have, if you have a tip which has been designed in a way that cannot sort of slide inside the boat, which is the case of the uh, 11th hour quorum and I think all of the foils that we've seen there, then you end up with the situation, well, Bureau Valet has done it really in a different context, which they've sort of gone, uh, they have the, the junction with the hull high up, so they, they make this whole thing disappear. But anyway, um, and so you end up in those conditions where you could see the windward foil was just slightly flirting with the water every now and again. And that's something that you want to avoid, but, but it becomes, uh, uh, so that's kind of the game. And then I'll finish by saying that there is something, this, this I learned in, this I, I learned sailing them. I sort of, in the previous, in the, in the moment of designing them prior of sailing, um, I sort of uh, saw this uh, situation, but it really became completely evident once the boats went sailing, which is this uh, downwind VMG in waves uh, situation, uh, which is um, that, uh, over a certain wind angle, uh, I would say, you know, wh whenever there's wind and whenever there's waves, when it's flat water is not a problem, but whenever there's waves, oceanic waves, let's say over uh, 12, 14 knots of wind speed, uh, and when you're sailing wider than 135 or 138 true wind angle, the boat goes into a situation where it doesn't need any side force. It needs actually even probably negative side force if you could. What it needs is just to get the bow out of the water because then it sort of keeps hitting. Because the boats go so much quicker than the waves, then the waves become um, breaks, you know, so you need to try to fly above them. But it becomes extremely difficult to uh, fly the boat in such an unstable situation. So you end up uh, in a mode which is a bow up mode. So you put the, the, bot the back of the boat in the water which is what gives them that sort of uh, stability, but you want to get the bow as, as high up in the water as possible. And so without creating any side force. 
And so for that, you need to, um, you need to uh, get the foil sort of more horizontal um, and, uh, and, and, and nothing side force wise. Um, this is why we did the curvature in, in, in quorum in the way we did it, because then when you need the side force, you extend, and you also need the right moment, you extend the foil outboard, and then you have that angle I was telling you about, about 20 degrees. But then when we go VMG downwind, you basically retract it with that sort of curvature, and then the foil becomes completely horizontal and it has no side component, which was supposed to be a good VMG downwind mode. The problem we find now is that although all that works theoretically, uh, because you do that, the foil end, ends up being not very deep in the water. So the, the, the boat does everything that it was supposed to do, but the bow is not high enough. So the bow, which is about 600, 500, 600 millimeters from the water, uh, is sailing in waves of two meters and, and, and it's not high enough. Um, and that's what I think Guillaume's done very well because he's got the curvature in the opposite direction. So basically, uh, when he when when his foil is more horizontal, is also uh, deeper, the deeper. The problem in that mode is that you end up also having it the furthest away from the heart, and therefore you end up having a writing moment which you don't necessarily need at that at that point. But, but the point I'm making is, which is the, 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 the biggest issue that these emocas are, are seeing, the, the, the foiler emocas are seeing in, the, in, 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 in this uh, context, is the VMG downwinding waves. This is where the 65s actually have, a, have an edge on them because, because, you know, the 65s, they sail heel, they basically sail the way they sail. I'm not going to say it's very elegant, but nonetheless, they do go through the water pretty nicely. Um, and so in Imocas, we're now learning that we, in those conditions, we need to put the bow very high up in the, in the, in the air. And to do that, you need to have the foil very deep on the, on the so none of the, none of the solutions of the curvature in one direction, which is what I did, or the curvature in the opposite direction, which is what Guillaume did, seems to be super efficient in those conditions. Uh, so we're now working into new uh, ways, which, which are probably going to, straighter shafts, which is kind of what VPLP is done. Uh, and, uh, and so you end up giving away performance in some conditions, but you end up gaining in that infamous VMG downwind in ocean waves, which has, which has come to be the biggest hiccup of the Imoca 60s, which we are not all now scratching our heads on how to do. But, but uh, we're trying to achieve that without giving away performance anywhere else. And that's the, what I'm telling you now is what you're going to see, the new generation foils are going to come up. Some of them are being built, some of them are going to come a bit later, but that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the next generation that's going to come up. Uh, you will see in the Jacques Vabre and, and the rest. You, you know, we talk a lot about the foils and for all those reasons that you've just outlined as to why the foils are so interesting. And I can understand from a design point of view, what an interesting puzzle. You know, because the rules aren't really too friendly for foiling. So you have to sort of think round the problem. And it, it's interesting to hear you try to solve it. But because you're doing ocean racing, you also have to think about the hull. Because there are times where you're going to be in the water or smashing into the water. And the hulls of the, the Amoka 60s that we have in the Ocean Race Europe are very different. So... I think the bow is probably a good place to start because it, yeah. you know, it, that kind of dictates yeah. the, the, the shape. So just why so many different approaches to that part of the well, boat? The, the bows are directly related to that uh, point of sailing that I was telling you about, which is the VMG downwind uh, ocean, where you cannot get the bow high enough uh, and you're going quicker than the waves. So... Uh, which is what Biro Valle, the uh, old L'Occitane, uh, did quite well because they came out with this bow, which, uh, which basically is more wave, ocean wave friendly. I think that we're all going to move in that direction now because what we find out, at least what I find out, is that what you're losing, what you're losing in those conditions uh, is quite significant compared to if you don't have that kind of bow compared to what you gain with a more traditional bow in the other conditions. Um, so kind of the, 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 the title of what's been happening in the last year or so since the Vendée Globe is how much, how much these boats sail VMG downwind. 
and uh, and how much you lose if you don't do all these things, bow and foil combined. Um, so you're right in pointing out that the bows are the the, the, the biggest issue, and uh, and and it's completely VMG um, ocean VMG related. I think that we're all going to move into that direction. And then there is the, the transoms, uh, which are basically elevators in a way, because uh, since the rudders don't have, um, the, by the rule, doesn't allow you to have any elevators, the only way you can sustain a sort of uh, moderate flight. Well, let's start from the fact that for flying, you need a joystick somewhere. I mean, I think this is something that the aeronautical world has found out uh, a long time ago. I think that since the America's Cup has gone flying and from the AC-72s in San Francisco to the latest AC-75s, I think we all figure it out <laughs> that you need a joystick and you need move, rapidly moving flaps, okay? So we don't have any of that in the Imoca. So, but, but yet the boat is capable of going flying. So you say, okay, well, where is my joystick? Where, how can I deal with that? And so that's where the transom comes in and uh, in that flight mode, um, you end up uh, basically stabilizing the boat in a moment that it sort of takes off. It's completely unstable, but you set it up in a way that it sort of falls down from the transom. And then the transom becomes sort of an elevator and it, it, it bounces and then it gets the boat flying again and then it falls in the transom and bounces and you know it goes up. So that's how they fly, basically. The transom becomes the stabilizer of the... I mean, you pray to God that it doesn't go the other way because if it goes nose first, then that that is pretty bad, which, which happens sometimes. But, um, so that's what the transom is, is about. And then the middle of the boat is... Uh, it's about uh, the, the uh, outrigger cable, <laughs> funny enough. So you end up, the, this mast of the outriggers, as you know, and then the, the, the outriggers are, are connected to the boat through a cable. And that cable cannot have an angle which is smaller than a certain amount, I think it's 23 degrees, to the outrigger. So you're trying to make boats fairly narrow, if you will, because now the righty moment comes from the foils. Uh, so, you know, you're sort of playing a game of making the hull as narrow as you can. But, uh, but if you make it too narrow, that cable just doesn't fall anywhere. So you, end, you need to make the hulls in the middle kind of um, play a game to be as narrow as they can be, but, uh, but have a receiver for this cable. This is why you can see in, in Corum, there is like a, in, in, I think uh, Guillaume's done this as well. You can have, a, you have like a local bump on the, on the hull just to receive the cable. <laughs> um, because you, you would want to make the, the hulls narrower if you could. So that kind of defines the bow, the middle, and the transom. Uh, that is fascinating. It, uh, wonderful to hear that little measurement bumps that I remember from International <laughs> 14s or something like that. There are some bumps in Imoga, I can tell you that, because then you have other things, which are the two other bumps. One is the, there's a rule called the 110 degree uh, ABS, which basically puts the boat at 110 degree heel. And, um, and so sort of the boat, in the worst case scenario, has to come back, has to sort of redress itself from that position. And in order to do that, you need to sort of shape the, the canoe body, the submerged canoe body at 110 degree heel needs to be done in a way to foment and to uh, allow for the boat to sort of come back in that. And so if you imagine the boats at 110 degree heels, you could see in Corum and uh, Corum more than others, but in, in all the boats, you can see that the shape of the top sides of the boat in the middle there. And that, that shape is actually the 110 degree <laughs> heel canoe body. So, um, so that's the first bump, the 110 degree. And then you have the 180 degree return. So basically the rule tells you when the boat is upside down 180 degrees without the mast, because it's assumed that by that point you've broken the mast, um, or without any resistance of the mast, um, then when you can't the keel to the side, the boat needs to come back from 180 degrees. Now, of course, when you do that, the bumps that you just made to pass the 110 become really annoying because the boat is almost like a catamaran and then it doesn't want to come back. So uh, you then need to put a lot of volume in the middle uh, to help the boat come back uh, from the 180 and overcome the 110. That bump in the middle is called the coach roof. So, which accessor uh, you know, accessorily helps the crew stay dry. <laughs> and so, 
the middle bump is uh, the coach roof, which is completely designed to foment the 180 degree. Well, I mean, of course, it has to house the crew and the cockpit. But, but, but it also has to provide the central volume so the, the boat can sort of return when it's 180. So you're right, you know, you have now the bump in the, the so the funky shape of the bow, which is a very VMG downwind wave related thing. The bump in the middle for the cable of the outrigger, the transom shape, which is a little bit of an elevator that you would like to have in the rudder, but you can't. Uh, the side bump, which is the 110 degree bump. And then you have the coach roof, which has to help the boat come back from 180. So it, it, Animoca equals a bumped boat for sure. <laughs> I, I would love to talk to the person who, or the, the the group of people who originally designed, you know, the Amoka rule. Because when it gets into the hands of people like yourself, you'll <laughs> always find a way to get the shape that you want. Um, Juan, listen, we, we're going to have to leave it. Um, we've got we've got the boat about to leave, but um, yeah, thank you very much. Always fascinating to get to get your knowledge on this. Thank you. Good day today. A big thank you to Juan for giving me his time to talk us through such an incredibly uh, interesting and detailed topic. Uh, if you're like me, you'll want to rewind that and try and pick apart all those little moments and all those little pieces of information that he dropped out along the way. Um, like I say, we didn't mean to have uh, an episode of Off Watch ready to go. So this is a little bit of a one-off treat, but we will be back soon with some more episodes and some more incredible conversations with the people that matter at the heart of the race. So subscribe if you want to stay up to date with all the latest info and we'll see you soon.